you know, when did you first, I mean, listen, a lot of guys that I've had on, they talk about, oh, I took the police test and I took the fire test and the PD or the FD called me first. Was that you or did you always specifically want to be a fireman? Uh, well, no, that's, that's me too, except in a different context. Um, after high school, uh, I thought I was, I wanted to be a police officer. So I went to State University of Farmingdale and I got an associate's degree in criminal justice. Uh, in my second year, because it was a two-year college back then, now it's turned into a, a, a four-year university. But um, in 76, um, one of my buddies uh, that I played football with on the Freeport you know, high school team, his brother was the captain of the hook and ladder, the volunteer department in Freeport, Freeport Volunteer Fire Department. And he had approached me and he said, hey, you know, my brother, they need some young guys. Would you be interested in, in joining? He said, I'm thinking about joining. So I had never thought about the fire department, but I figured out, you know, law enforcement, I may be pulling up to, you know, a, a building on fire at some point. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad thing to, uh, you know, to get to learn. So I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So um, he said, well, Sunday mornings is the big morning. You know, you come down, that's when they wash the rigs and check the equipment and, uh, you know, do all kinds of, you know, different duties that they have. So I went down on a Sunday morning and um, my buddy Mike was there. And then, you know, all the guys in the department, they were happy to see some young faces. And, um, uh, you know, so I got involved with that day, you know, the washing of the rig and learning what some of the tools were. And uh, then they were having, you know, that later on that week, they were having a meeting and, and you know, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing, but I, so I decided I was going to join the volunteer fire department. So I did. Uh, I went through that process and um, I joined. I went through the Nassau County Fire Academy and, you know, became a, a, a firefighter where I you know, could actually, once I graduated the probing school, I could fight fires. And in, in that company, <clears throat> there were two city firemen, uh, Vinny Segreto and Bob Courtney that lived in Freeport. So they were New York city firemen, but they volunteered in, in Freeport. So I kind of, um, uh, you know, would follow on their shirt, you know, their, their coattails. And, um, one, so one evening, uh, we went, uh, we, they have what, um, what they call, uh, either mutual aids or you can cover, uh, in the volunteer fire service every year, there's, you have a, uh, a big dinner for with a new chief that that's going in. And so th that department's out of service. So Roosevelt fire department was out of service. And what they do is they ask different, the surrounding towns each to supply a company. So Freeport was asked to supply a truck company. So we went and covered the district for them that evening. But lo and behold, uh, that evening, there was a basement fire in a, in a commercial building in a strip mall. So uh, it, this was my first actual fire. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're there with a full crew and my, my Vinny Segreto, one of the city firemen was working. So I, you know, I always used to try to hang with one of those guys, figure I could learn a lot from them and, uh, geared up and Vinny was like, come on, let's go. And next thing I know, I'm going down these basement stairs with, you know, smoke pouring out of this big, you know, black smoky abyss. I can't see my hand in front of my face and pretty much uh, scared, you know, like, uh, I, I can't, I know we can't, I can't use scared to death, scared to death. But yeah, as you would say, blankless, I was scared blankless going down <laughs> into this smoky abyss. And, um, I'm like keeping my hand on the back of his coat. And, you know, I'm, as we're going down, I'm feeling some heat and he's in there. He says, come on, we're going to go, you know, search for, for the seat of the fire. And, all I know is we get down to the basement stairs where now he's crawling and I'm crawling and it's getting hotter and there's a lot of smoke. Uh, and he's saying it's up ahead and he's calling for the line on the radio. Uh, so the engine company is coming down with the line. Next thing I know, I hear water, you know, shooting. I'm pretty much clueless, you know? Um, and, and I hear Vin Vince there, come on over here, you know, bring your tool. And I still can't see anything, but like an, but an orange glow. And then that went out pretty quickly. Uh, again, making a long story short, it wasn't it was it wasn't a, a huge fire, but it was you know in, in a basement you don't have you know much place for the heat or smoke to go. So the engine knocked the fire down. Uh, once it started clearing a little bit, um, he's got me overhauling the fire, you know, moving stuff around, you know, getting me hot spots. 
And um, you know, down in maybe a half an hour, we come out. My, my tank is just about empty. And my heart's racing a thousand miles an hour. And uh, I'm, I'm out in the fresh air. And it, it was like, I'm, I'm like, wow, that was some adrenaline rush. Like I had never felt anything like that in my life. And look, I'm still alive. I made it out and I'm still alive. And I was like, wow. I was like, I guess like going on a roller coaster for the first time, you know, I was like, I can do this. And um, that just planted a seed. And I was like, you know what? I think I might want to think about doing this for a living. So um, I did. Now, in the meantime, I did take the Nassau County cops test because that had come up first. Mm -hmm. um, but there was some, I remember back then, there was a little bit of a delay with coming up, uh, you know, with the, with the grades and everything. But in the meantime, I saw, because the city fire department gives the test every four years. So I saw there was a test coming up in 78. So it was about a year and three quarters away. And uh, I asked Vinny, you know, where do I get the application? And what do I have to do? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, he says, well, when the applications come, I'll tell you how to get it. And in the meantime, uh, I just focused uh, on the test. I mean, I had to work at the time. I, was done. I finished college. Uh, my father was able to help me get a job at Pan Am. So I was working. That's when there was a Pan Am Airlines back then. So I was working uh, in the cargo building. So as a new guy, I was working a midnight shift from 1130 to, at night to 730 in the morning. And I was driving the forklifts unloading the 747 freighters they had. But I would come home in the morning and I would go right to the Freeport Rec Center and work out. Um, uh, then I would take my bike and ride it. It was like a 12 mile ride down to Jones Beach, run the boardwalk, come back, ride the bike home. Because back then, 50 percent of your grade was based on your physical score. So, you know, you, you took you were going to sit uh, for your written and that was going to be 50 percent. And then the the physical back then, I think, was seven or eight events. And each one had a different score, uh, but it, it added up to a thousand points. So if you got a thousand points, that was like getting a hundred. And if you got a hundred on your written, that, you know, it averaged out to a hundred, which I don't think anybody, anybody did. Like, I think my written score was at a ninety six and uh, I got like eight hundred and eighty points out of the thousand, which was pretty good. Yeah. Um, uh, so I ended up. I think 780 on the list of 42,000. So um, I got hired fairly quickly. I think it was back then they were putting the classes through uh, every six weeks. So my class, I think the first class might have been September of 78. And my class started February of 79. And that's when I got in. So, so I guess that was a long winded answer. But yes, I did think about being a cop. But once I got involved with the Freeport Volunteer Fire Department and fought a fire, and, and I might add that back then, even the volunteer, Freeport Volunteer Department was pretty busy. Um, and, you know, we were going to, I mean, I remember like some weekends having three house fires in a weekend, and then maybe you'd go two weeks without a fire, but there'd be, a, you know, then you'd have a fire. So, it, you know, after that fire in Roosevelt, I think the following week I had a fire in a Queen Anne in Freeport. And, you know, once I, once, I wet my whistle and I was starting to get some confidence in myself and learning the different uh, aspects of, of, you know, being a firefighter um, that changed my mind. Now, eventually uh, I had, I think I had about six months on FDNY and Nassau County PD called, they called my number. Um, but at that point, I mean, they were making more money, but it wasn't about the money at that point. I just really, loved firefighting and the whole aspect of it and that's that's how i chose my career path imagine the senior dude carrying a gun and, and pulling you over for doing 55 and a 45 i can't even <laughs> picture it but no listen you know, I, I, I can't either because I, I have a low tolerance for knuckleheads so uh i mean i'm a pretty compassionate guy but i see some of the things that these cops today have to put up with uh, I don't, I don't think I could. So I give them a lot of credit. Um, you know, sometimes they got to eat crow and, it, and it's, uh, you know, I'm just very happy that I chose the career path I did because it, it was a good fit for me. Absolutely. And don't even worry about the long winded answer. I always say the more the guest talks on the podcast, the better the podcast is. I want to know everything. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're, we're under no time limit here. So, um, you know, getting to edge and 280 and, and ladder 132, <clears> which is where the early years were spent. 
I mean, proby life is interesting. I had this conversation with Ray and Dennis, uh, but you had some experience. You'd been on the fire floor, as the guys on Getting Salty call it before. So given that, I don't know if the guys in your house knew that, but given the fact that you had had some experience, they go easy on you as a proby or, or are they still kind of, uh, you know, trying to trying to feel you out at first? No, there's, there's, there's no easy on a, on the, on a proby. And if anything, it, it probably works against you. Mm. Um, because they just have another avenue to, to, you know, to bust your chops. Like once they found out that I was a, a volunteer, um, they used to call me Molly of the volley. <laughs> so, yeah, that was uh, like my, my, the, my senior man in engine 280, God rest his soul, Dorio Cairo, a big stocky uh, Italian guy that was, uh, he'd give you the shirt off his back. And, um, but that, I, you know, I think he coined that term. He was like, hey, Molly the volley, come here, I need some. You know, and that was, so that, that stuck. But, um, and, and actually it works against you in Proby school too, because you try not to, to, to show your cards. You know, you, you know, they may be teaching something that, and it's, and it, it, and it's the New York City way. Um, now, fortunately, truck company in Freeport did a lot of this, the same training that uh, and tactics that New York City did because we had some city firemen that would, were teaching us back then, but you still don't want to you know like I said tip your hand. So uh, you know in the I mean I, I did I did well in Proby school. I always did well on the written tests and I did well in the field. Um, but one day I remember um, when they were first teaching us nomenclature of the different truck company tools, and the instructor at one point you know it was the flathead axe and the halligan and, and he held up the hook. But another name for a hook is a pike pole, but not in New York City. It's a hook. And out in, out in Valley Land, we would call it a pike pole. And apparently on the West Coast, they call it a pike pole or something. So that he holds it up. And what's this? And I was like, oh, that's a pike pole. And like his head turned. And he goes, well, we were firing out in California somewhere. This is not a pike pole. It's a hook. He said, you must be one of them volleys out on the island. You know, so I was like, ooh. You know, so like, you, know, you, know, you don't get... They, it's not like, oh, it works in your favor. No, because it's like they feel they have to retrain you on everything you learned already. So, uh, yeah, no, that, that's uh, to answer that question. No, you go in there like you know nothing. You keep your mouth closed and your ears open. And that's how you succeed. And you have to, you know, back then you, had, well, you also had a plan on getting your chops busted. I mean, that's just the way it was. You know, they want to, you know, they, they want to see what you can take. And, um, you know, it, it's all it's all part of the brotherhood. I know things have changed now and I, I can't I don't know whether it's for the better or the worse. I, you know, um, I, I do know it, it's cyclical that when I got on every 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 few years, things change and they'll come down with new rules and stuff. And I remember the senior guys then saying, oh, kid, this job is different than it was 10 years ago. You know, it's like, I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to retire. And. You know, I guess it's the same way with me. Things that we were allowed to do and, you know, some of the, the you know, the so-called hazing of the proby, you know, now you can't do it. Um, it's, you know, to, to me, I, I, I'm glad I went through it. I think it was a character builder. Um, uh, you know, um, so I, I, I was, I feel I was very fortunate to get on the job when I did and have and work in the places that I worked. It was a, I w- it was a blessed career for me. Absolutely. And we'll dive deeper to it as we go. We're talking with Hank Malay here on the Mike Game podcast is volume three of the miniseries, the best of the bravest. You know, it's funny, a couple notes on that, because you mentioned it working against you. The last guest I had is the PD, too, because, you know, I mentioned Detective McNally. I asked him when you got to the bomb squad, you know, he was a previously in the, in the military as an engineer working with explosives. Did they, did they like that? He said, no, they hated that. So it's it's interesting how they view it. Uh, but I guess there's a there's a reason to it. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of the people that get mad at some of the hazing and listen, obviously there's a line you don't want to cross. You don't want to go too far. But as, as I told Ray, listen, I survived the middle school lunch table. We grew up, my generation was the last generation. We said awful things to one another, allegedly, uh, at, the, at the middle school lunch table. So it's just like, you know, hey, hey listen, I don't know. I just, I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, you know, it was, it was it, listen, it was stupid, you know, frat stuff, but mm-hmm. it, it was funny. And, and it, it took the edge off sometimes, you know, and, and sometimes you need that because you, you do, you do see a lot of, a lot of bad things and, and a lot of hurtful things um, and, and things that, you know, can scar your memory. So, you know, if there are things that you can bring some levity, you know, like I said, this wasn't like, you know, there wasn't anybody getting hurt, but if it was, you know, the new guy walking in a firehouse 
and you know he's putting his key in the door and, and a bucket of water with toilet paper gets dumped on him and now he's got you know wet, wet paper all like he looks like paper mache all right you know that, that was just that was some of the antics um yeah you know, some of the other stuff like you, you, i remember uh, this wasn't in my firehouse but it was another firehouse on bedford avenue they had a guy that uh, a new a probie that got there and he was uh, you know a bodybuilder he was all ripped and everything and so um you know and, and believe me the firemen have they have a gag for, for everybody that walks in the firehouse and you know so this guy's a muscle guy all right so we're going to get him so they said uh so you know they say you work out a lot yeah i work out all the time and you know so they you know they're, they're pumping him up you know like so he can pump himself up they say you know one of the things we do here to see if uh, how strong you are you, you take the ladder belt, which back then was a big thick belt uh, of you know webbing, and it had a, it had like an a eight or ten inch hook on it because you used to put the roof rope on it if you had a slide to make a roof rope rescue. So they said, well, you put the you put the belt on, and then you go uh, now on the old rear mount aerials, the aerial itself would stick about three feet in front of the cab, you know, at, at about maybe seven feet high, seven and a half feet high. So they said, well, you know. Um, we had, so they said, yeah, we had one guy, he could get to the front of the aerial there and pull himself up with one arm and then grab the hook and get it up there and then hook it onto the, uh, onto the tip of the aerial. Let's see if you could do that. I think I could do that. So he puts the belt on, he gets to the, uh, you know, pulls himself up and he's struggling. He gets, gets the hook up and boom, now he has the hook on. Now the thing is, once you get that hook on, I don't care how strong you are, you're not getting it off because, you know. So now he's hanging and they're like, all right, get out of it. And he, now he's struggling. So now, now they're just laughing. They got him. So the chauffeur starts to rig up. They open the apparatus doors and they pull his pants down to his ankle. So he's in his underwear. And then they shoot the, uh, the, the, the aerial ladder out the front doors of the firehouse, you know, dangling at the curb. And now he's, he's at the curb dangling there with his pants around his ankles and he can't get out. And they're like, welcome <laughs> to the firehouse. You know, you, you're going to sit there and tell us how strong you are and how tough you are. You, you know, you can push 300 pounds. Now, let's see if you can push a broom, you know. So, I mean, these were some of the, you know, the, the stupid antics. But you know what? I'm sorry. Back then it was funny and everybody got a good laugh out of it. And, uh, you know, and even the people in the neighborhood that lived around, they knew. I mean, because everybody, they knew that whatever the issue was, they could go to the firehouse and it would be rectified if they had a problem. You know, if they had a leaky faucet, they could, you know, borrow a tool or, you know, I mean, if a kid came around and needed, you know, needed a, a quarter for a, a candy bar or something, you know, the guys would always bust chops a little bit, but the kid would end up, if he needed a quarter, he'd walk away with 50 cents. So, you know, they, so if they saw that they knew we are, they're only up to their antics again. So they, you know, they would just laugh and, you know, go, you know, go back and do whatever they were doing. But, you know, so, but those days are over. Those days are yeah. over now. But exactly. Uh, yeah. Even something as simple, there's, there's a great clip on YouTube. Uh, of, it's called The Bravest. I'm sure you've seen it where they profile rescue one a few months before September 11th. And the late, great Joe Angelini gets like a shaving kit. They had Todd Smith, I guess, subbing in uh, for like a, somebody who was out for whatever reason. And it's a shaving kit because the guy looked like he was 12. He was so clean shaven. And they were calling him Sweet Pea. And they said the joke being, since he's so clean shaven, he forgot his shaving kit at his previous firehouse at Rescue One. Like little stuff like that. It keeps right. it light and it's not malicious, you know? It's not malicious. Right, so, right. You know, for sure. Uh, I, I do want to ask you now, Engine 280, Ladder 132. Uh, Ray did a great job of explaining the duties of an engine at a fire. And so I want to ask you about a ladder because it may seem obvious. Oh, they go up there, they get the people there. But there's, it's more complex than that, obviously. Um, and so let's dig deeper. You literally have, if you're going up there, a box seat to the action. And then you're on the roof. You're looking to, to see how you can enter the building. And roof fires, as you know, are, are quite dangerous because there's the ever-present risk of a floor collapse. So whenever you find yourself in that bucket up on that roof, what were the personal keys for you that allowed you to stay focused on the task at hand and, and really block out the chaos that surrounded you in that moment? Okay. Well, for, first, let's back up a second. So Fat Daddy told you about engine operations, you know, stretching the hose line. You're asking me about truck company operations, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what you want to know? Yes. Okay. So um, truck company operations is not just guys going to the roof. Okay. And, and, and you'll be surprised if I sit down at a dinner table sometimes with a group and people find out you were a fireman and they actually, uh, you know, if they start asking questions, um, 
they're they're all at a gas that they, they never realize. You know, most people have the impression it's like, yeah, the clown car pulls up and everybody runs out and everybody's running this way, that way, and eventually the fire goes out. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. Every, you know, an engine company, everybody, they have their specific assignments, you know, the nozzle, the backup, the control, the door. And again, it depends on manning. Some departments don't have the same manning, but they still have to have a nozzle man. They have to have a backup man. Well, in, in, with the truck company, at least in New York City, you have your chauffeur and your officer. Okay. You have a roof man. You have an OVM, which is the outside vent man. You have a forcible entry man and a can man. Okay. They each have a specific set of tools they bring. The, the can man and the forcible entry man team up with the officer and they become the forcible entry team. And they have numerous duties. If, if, the, if they need to force their way into the building, that's what they have to do. It could be something simple as a wooden door or maybe it's a, a, a metal roll down gate at a commercial where it has to be cut open. And, and you know, they need the forcible entry man may have to go get the, the metal cutting saw. It may be a metal buck door. It could be a Fox lock in Manhattan where they're going to have to take the plate off the door and use different tools to get through it. So that's there. And then once they get through, they need to find, you know, it's not like on TV all the time where you, you, you know, fire is showing itself. You pull up the buildings. A lot of times it's just marshmallow smoke. You don't know where the, the fire is and you can't just go shooting water on smoke because you're not putting the fire out. So it's their job to also find the seat of the fire. Well, that's going on. The, the outside vent man has to survey the building. And again, depends on the type of the building. High rise, he's got a totally different job than he does at a private dwelling or a tenement. So let's take a tenement, for example. The OV is going to drop the fire escape ladder. Uh, he's going to take a portable ladder off the truck, throw it, and he's going to take the fire escape to go up to whatever floor the fire is on or the fire apartment and try to make entry into the apartment that way. And normally in New York City, it's easier said than done because normally you're met with a scissor gate. So now you have to be able to force the, the scissor gate open. Um, and, and, you know, the scissor gates are the gates basically that they're, they're, they're prevent the burglars from getting on the fire escape and breaking into your apartment. So there's a padlock on the inside with a guard. So, you know, people are more concerned with their security and being broken into and being harmed or their things being stolen than they are having a fire. But when there is a fire, it makes it tougher for the fireman trying to get in. So that, that OB's got his job to do. He needs to get in the apartment. And at that point, he's going in and making a search. He's going to try to get to, you know, start, start where, you know, where he gets in and search towards the fire. The roof man, he's going to, he, again, in a high rise, it's different from a commercial. It's different from a peaked roof private dwelling. But the roof man's job is... To get to that roof, let's say on a, again on a, let's say a tenement or a commercial, he's got to get up there. So is he taking the aerial? Is he taking a bucket? Because truck companies generally have two different types of apparatus. You're either going to have a bucket like a towel ladder, the bucket you stand in, or or you're going to be climbing an aerial ladder. So depending, like 132 is an aerial ladder, so you might be climbing that. You might be going uh, to an adjoining building, you're going up the stairs, out the bulkhead, and then across the roof because you know you can get through there. You can't go through the fire building because you're going to get hit with the fire floor. And that's the last thing you want to do is even, even let's say the fire is on the fourth floor and the, the apartment door hasn't been opened yet. So now if you, you try to go through the interior, first off now, where's the smoke going? Path of least, re, least resistance is up the stairs. So you got all the smoke that's going up to where that bulkhead door is. Now you get there, very, you know, it's quite possible it's going to be chained. So now you're trying to get out, or even if it's not chained, even if you're trying to get up, now they for, at that point, the forcible entry team opens the door. Where Now it's coming. All that heat and hot gases are coming up and possibly fire. And now you're at the top of the, of the barbecue spit getting cooked up there. So you're never going through the interior. So you have to, as a roof man, you know, there's different ways. You may, you may be taking your aerial. You may have to go to the rear fire escape and go up the gooseneck. You may go through the adjoining building. If it's a big H type apartment house and the fire is on one side of the building, you may go to the opposite side and take the stairs on the opposite side. But again, this comes with training, knowing your buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how you stay alive. You have to become a student of the trade you're in. 
to me, that always made the better flying. I mean, there are some guys that just show up for work. And then there were guys that are students of the job. And uh, luckily with the fire department, 90% of the people there are students of the job. There's always going to be one or two guys there. It's just a job. Somebody told me to take the civil service test. And, you know, it's a paycheck. But the thing that I loved about the job, and especially the places I worked, um, everybody was into the job. And you could depend on each other to know their job. So, th so those... Those assignments I gave you, those are all the different areas that a truck company has to handle. So the, now you did you want further? You were asking me about actually up on the roof. Is that what you, you want to dive into that? Just in those moments, obviously, you know, and you kind of touched on it, but there's always the present danger of, of course, the roof collapse, but you're also trying to properly vent the fire. And, and listen, I, I'm the ultimate buff. So I, I'd like to get a deeper sense of this stuff, too. So if you want to dive into that, please feel free to do so. I'd love to learn. No, I mean, you know, the the. The roof is a tough job. And a lot of times, um, I know even on, on uh, you see, I, I'm getting salty to it. Guys talk about the roof sometimes like it's a, uh, like you're banished or something. <laughs> to me, the, the roof, a, a good, you know, a good man, a good roof man can make or break what's going on down below. Uh, you know, I know when I was in 132, uh, I caught a lot of jobs as the roof man. And, and I'll tell you what, when you're down, when you're down in that smoky hallway and everything's banked down, you know, you want to kiss that roof, man. When he gets up there and he gets that, that bulkhead door forced and now you're taking, you know, you're taking the, uh, the cover off the chimney and now that smoke and heat has a place to go and it makes your life more tenable in that hallway until you can get in there and, and, and fight the fire. Um, that makes it, you know, it makes a, a big difference. So, you know, the roof man's got to get up there. He has, he's by himself. He's got to force the door by himself. Um, you know, he's got to make sure that door stays open. How do you do that? Okay, well, a lot of times you want to break the top hinge off the door so now the door can't close. Or a lot of times there's old buckets of tar or whatever on the roof, you know, but you, that door has to stay open. If there's a skylight on top of the bulkhead and you can get up there, you get up there and you break the skylight too to get more of that. Now you have to make a survey around the whole perimeter of the roof because guys in the front, the chief and everybody else, they can't see what's going on in the rear or in the courtyards. Uh, there were times when you know, make a survey. I remember in, uh, in, in Rescue One and um, uh, 30 truck was relocated to 35 truck, daytime fire. And uh, their roof man had gotten up there as we were rolling in and was doing his survey, looked over the side and um, it was a, a seven story. Uh, it was six stories and then a story below and in, in the rear. Uh, there was an, an old guy straddling the windowsill with smoke pouring out over his head, not screaming or anything, just, and the roof man looked down and this guy looked up and just gave him a wave. You know, you would think people would be screaming like, help, help, you know? So if, if this guy, if the roof man didn't do his complete survey, he wouldn't have known that guy was there. And then what happened is we ended up affecting a roof rope rescue and got the guy down to the ground and, and had a happy ending. But, you know, you want to do that survey. You want to see, not only just for people, you want to see, maybe, you know, you, you see you got smoke. Well, maybe there's fire blowing out two windows on the fourth floor. Well, now you, that information is critical. You get on the radio and let them know because they can't see in the front. All they know is they got smoke. Well, where is the fire apartment? Right. Oh, yeah, I got fire on the fourth floor. It's on the A side or the B side, you know. So that's all critical information. Maybe you have to cut the roof. You know, you're going up there with the, 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 the roof man's like a pack mule. You know, the top floor, he's going, he's got his... He's got the roof rope, the saw, his tools, he, and his gear. He's about 125, 130 pounds over body weight. And now maybe you're climbing an aerial. You're climbing six, six stories, seven stories, the stairs to get up there. You know, it's a young man's job, and you got to be in shape. You know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no 300 pounders doing that because you're. By the time you get up there, you're going to be huffing and puffing and having a heart attack. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's the roof. The, you know, a good roof man is worth his weight in gold. Absolutely. And there's no 110 pounders either. So, <laughs> so but you, you know, it's funny, though, because to, to, we're both baseball fans to use a baseball analogy. You know, every man plays a role. It's like the one through nine. Think about like as you and I both being Yankee fans, those great Yankee teams in the late 90s. Right. Derek Jeter, Chuck Malblock, they work the count. They get on base and Bernie Williams drives him in or Paul O'Neill drives him in. Similarly, at a fire, every guy plays a role to where you got a roof man doing a survey, as you said. He notices something, the guys in the ground, the information gets to them. They do, they do their job and it functions like a well-oiled machine. And that's, what's always fascinated to me 
uh, fascinating to me about, you know, as someone who grew up around firehouse, grew up around cops, is that just the teamwork and just the, how over time the training is so good, it becomes instinct, it becomes muscle memory. And you guys, I mean, I'm not just saying this just to blow smoke up your rear and because you're sitting here, you guys in New York, everywhere around the world, good trained firemen, you make it look so easy. And it's when you do the deep dives, you see it's not, but the training is followed so well. And as you said, students of the job, they they really do make it look like it's another day at the beach, basically. Well, one of the things that we did in New York, and, and I'm sure it's, I would assume it's done. I, I know the fellas I know in some other states and I've made friends is after the fire, you go back and you critique. So this way, it's, what just happened is fresh in everybody's mind and you critique what, what, what happened, what went right, what went wrong. And God help you if you didn't cover your assignment, you know, like uh, I remember one time where the roof man, there was, there was uh, uh, someone to be rescued and the roof man went to make the rescue when he should have been going to get the roof. There's, everybody's capable of making that rescue. And uh, this wasn't in my company. It was in, it was in a, another a nearby company. And I believe even though he made the rescue, the officer, the captain, uh, wouldn't, was not writing him up for, for a rescue uh, because he did not do his assignment. By him not doing that could have you know, affected the, the rest of the operation for the guys. You know, there wasn't a vent happening on the roof. The, door, the bulkhead door wasn't getting open. You know, the perimeter search wasn't being made. All these things weren't being made because this guy was going for the glory. You know, they have the chauffeur and the OV are quite capable of making that same rescue. You know, so and that's that would be their job, you know, at the, at the front windows. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's the, each job is critical. And the reason, you know, like you said, the guys know uh, what they're doing is because you constantly train and you constantly critique and you always looking to better yourself. And when you're, you know, every week, every two weeks, you always see something, you know, if you follow the different fire uh, things online and stuff, there's a job somewhere where something went wrong. And we tend, we take those jobs and we try to study it and find out what, what it was that caused the catastrophe or the death or the near miss. So we hopefully won't make the same mistakes. And that's, that's what you have to do. You want to be proactive and not reactive. And I think that that's, that's the best way to do that. And that's, I think that's anything in life as, as, as you and I both know, you know, you study it and kind of like before this, uh, this little lovely conversation we're having, everything that went on, as you were telling me off the air, you know, like learn from it, learn from it. Absolutely. That's right. They get as a learning experience. You know what? I mean, nobody got hurt on this one. It was, you know, it was uh, maybe delayed five or 10 minutes, but Everything that every little glitch, like I said, um, it, now that's that's etched in your mind, and you'll make sure that that doesn't happen again, Absolutely. because you're a student, you're a student of your game there. So you know, and obviously you you know you're learning your trade and you want to be the best that you can be, and that's what that's why. Now if you didn't care, you'd be like, eh, whatever, you know. So what? Maybe if it happens again, but no. When you really enjoy what you're doing and you want to excel at that job. You know, you take those little everything, you know, you turn you turn a mistake into a learn a good learning experience, make it a positive, And that's how you move forward and become better at what you do. Amen. Amen. So then I want to get to your years in uh, Rescue One. Um, and it was the, the late David Weiss who once said that, uh, quote, you can't beat the action of Manhattan, the fires, the buildings, it's tops, end quote. And it is. Um, and Rescue One, what an elite history, started in 1915, has been around for doing the math on the top of my head, 106 years. Um, and so this is a squad with a lot of great guys working in it. It's in the heart of Manhattan. The action is nonstop. How did you get there? Okay. Well, first of all, let's back up. You mentioned Dave Weiss, just a sidebar. Dave Weiss was a, a younger fellow also in the Freeport Volunteer Fire Department. That's right. So... Uh, and, and in the Freeport Truck Company, which is part, part of the answer to your question, there was three guys from Freeport Truck Company that were all in Rescue One. Myself, Paul Hashagen, who got there first, and Bruce Newberry. So the three of us from Freeport were all in Rescue One. And maybe that's what 
Um, maybe that was one of the reasons that prompted Dave to try to get there later on. Well, Dave wasn't in truck company. He was in an engine company, but we were all in the same department. And, um, you know, there was, there was always the, 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 I mean, everybody was friends, but then there was always the, the, the you know, the back and forth, the, you know, breaking going on. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that, that might've been one of the reasons that he uh, aspired to go to Rescue One because there were other guys from Freeport there. But I, I guess to answer your question, how did I get there or why did I get there or both? Well, just before I continue, quick note on Dave Weiss. Before he joined the fire department, he was also a steel worker. So he had experience with that, too, and which helped him, I'm sure, in, in his career. Rescue one. And if for my listeners, go look him up. He was uh, he's on YouTube as well. He was a very funny character. And, and he was a he great was, guy who, who did a he lot was of, a character. He who, was who, who, who did a lot of amazing things. So take the time to learn about him because he's he's uh, not with us anymore, sadly. But great legacy. So just, yeah, just getting back to, to your arrival at Rescue One, just how did the opportunity arise for you to, for you to get there? If you could take us through that. Okay. Well, I, th I think going, I have to go back to my roots in Freeport truck. Mm -hmm. um, there is no heavy rescue in Freeport. So Freeport truck did all the heavy rescue stuff. Mm -hmm. So we had the hearse tool and um, you know, we, we, were, we would get involved in the, the different heavy rescue type uh, you know, incidents that would come up. So, you know, I trained for doing that and I enjoyed doing it. Um, so now I get to, uh, I get to Brooklyn. I'm very happy where I am. Uh, it was, it was a great firehouse. You know, I saw a lot of work in a great battalion, one of the busiest battalions around back then, the three, eight, you know, I had, uh, you had 234 engine and 123, 249, 113, and then 280 and 132. So, and back then you only did details and overtime within that battalion, not like now where it's citywide. So any way you worked, you had potential that, you know, you know, you were pretty good chance you're going to a fire, whether it was a day tour or a night tour. So, um, you know, like I said, I loved where I was. Um, I was doing a lot of fire duty, but um, I wanted to do more. And at that point, Paul Hashagan, who had been in 25 truck in Manhattan, went to rescue one. And, you know, when I would see each other in a volley house, he'd be telling me about, you know, all the different things they were doing and the, the tools and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I reached a point where it was, it was a hard decision, but I was like, I felt like I had kind of topped out where I was. I had about eight, seven and a half, eight years in Brooklyn. And I had gone, you know, I'd gone to, my brownstone fires and my tenement fires and my commercial fires. And um, that, I mean, it never felt like I was an expert, but I felt like I was pretty darn good at what I, you know, at my trade at that point. And it was time to expand on it. I wanted to do more. I wanted to see other types of buildings and I wanted to do some of the other uh, rescue type work. And I loved going to fires so much in a rescue, you know, you go, if there's a fire in the borough, you go to every fire. Whereas if you're in a specific company, you go to the fires in your area. Um, but you know, you're not going to the other areas. So Hash had said to me, you know, the captain was looking, you know, for the, for, I was looking for young guys. And the captain at that time of rescue one had been a, uh, a fireman and a Lieutenant in the same area of Brooklyn where I was. So he was familiar with the companies and the type of work and the type of guys. So I decided that I was going to go for an interview. So I called up and asked if I could come in for an interview. He told me when to come in. I did. I went for the interview. He said, all right, you know, um, when I get the, an opening for you, uh, I'll call you over on an onion skin. And an onion skin basically is a detail. You don't just, you just don't go from one company into a special ops company. There's always a, a period, we'll call it a feeling out. You go there and uh, where you have enough time to do everything and make sure you and en you enjoy and it's for you and they see what you're about, whether you're, you're a good fit for the company. So, um, that's what I did. I waited until, uh, I got my chance. I believe I got called in July of 86 and I went and, um, I mean, the rest is history. I guess I, I you know, they, they liked me. I liked them. Uh, I had a pretty good background. You know, I mean, it, it, it made it easier too because because Paul Hashagan was there, and uh, I'm, I'm you know I'm sure he um, spoke in my favor. So the guys kind of knew, you know, it wasn't like a guy coming in that nobody knew. Um, 
so I was lucky on that aspect. I mean, I was still the junior guy, but it's not, it's not, there's no, like when there's no antics when you go, you know, when you go into a company like that, these are all senior guys. Right. And, and, um, you know, you, you've already done, done your college antics back in your, when you got on the job and now it's about, all right, how, you know, how do you listen? How, you know, what's the drill for the day? How are you adapting to the drill and the tools and everything? I mean, to give you an idea, I got to the company, I had eight years on the job. Um, John Driscoll, the senior man in the company who just passed away a couple of weeks ago, God rest his soul. He had 23 years in rescue one when I got there. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, no matter how chesty I'm coming from a busy Brooklyn truck company. I mean, you walk into a company and there's guys with 20 years, 23 years in just in rescue one, you know, they were, they were going crawling down hallways when I was kicking the slats out of my crib, you know? So, um, yeah, it's a humbling experience, but I got there and, um, it worked out. And in November of that year, the captain said to me, uh, do you enjoy being here? And I said, yeah, I do cap. He said, would you like to stay? And I said, yes, I would. And he said, okay. And he approved it. So in November I was transferred into rescue one. And you mentioned uh, Paul Hassig and I've been in touch with him. Paul, I, I got <laughs> Hank on the show. You're next pal. Come on, come on, come, come, come. You know, you want to. You know, but hopefully I can. He's a little busy, busy, right? He's a little yeah, busy, he's busy right? with a few things, but uh, hopefully I can get yeah. him on it in August, September around there. Great guy. Great guy. And, Listen, he's a he's a very he's a, he was a great fireman, and he's a, and he's an author. He's a, he's a very interesting guest to have. He's not, you know, he's not a boring guy like me or Fat Daddy. He's actually. Oh, got- stop. <laughs> I'm having a great time talking with you. And I had a great time with Ray. Ray was Ray was a, a, a great guest. And so if you so you had seven years with Rescue One when February 26, 1993 hit. I've always gotten the police with the miniseries involving the bomb squad. I've always gotten the police perspective of it. I've never gotten the fire <clears throat> perspective uh, of that day. I, I, I won't I shared a video the last episode. I won't do that here, but what I will share for the audience is just a clip of the FDNY uh, at the scene or a picture, I should say. Uh, the FDNY at the scene here. Let me just uh, edit this. And you see just the, the massive nature of the response uh, to this incident on February 26, 1993. Now, I've explained it to my listeners before, but if you're listening for the first time, you've never heard my show before. Uh, February 26, 1993 was a very cold day. The opposite of this one today is really hot. Uh, that day was your classic winter's day. And uh, Ramsey Youssef and uh, some of his cohorts who had been active in terrorism for a while, had been involved in some other dangerous incidents around the city. This is their step up, if you can call it that, to the big leagues, so to speak, in in terms of their evil vision. And so they park a truck full of explosives underneath the garage in the North Tower. And uh, about a few minutes after that, um, at around lunchtime, February 26, 1993, the bomb detonates. Six people are killed, thousands injured. um, And Hank was among the first responders to that incident. And and, uh, Hank, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. <clears throat> okay, uh, I was the chauffeur and rescue one that day. Um, I remember it, the uh, you know when the, when the box came in. Um, but before I get in, into that, let's back up one second, just just for the information of your listeners, in case because I know a lot of the young people they might not even have been born then. But um, the the thing that uh, helped catch the the terrorists. I forget which guy rented the van in, in Jersey, but he actually went back with the paperwork to get his two hundred dollar deposit back, yep. and that that's what helped, you know, catch uh, catch all of them. It was that, and I think it was something to do with the with the door on the van too. I, I know what you're talking about. I, I've actually had the guy on. He's a friend of mine, Donald Sadawi, who's an NYPD bomb squad detective. Him and uh, Agent Joe Hanlon of the ATF found the VIN number uh, from the chassis right. frame of the truck that was used in the bombing. Right. So uh, to sum it up, I mean, I, I did an episode on getting salty about that. and It was, it was like an, an hour just on that. I'm not going to take an hour doing it, but um that day for me was a very frustrating day because I felt like it was a no impact day because no matter what you did, um, just like on nine 11, it didn't, you felt like it, it had no impact on the overall, maybe it did, but you just, you, it was overwhelming. Um, but that being said, so box comes in, came, it came over as a possible transformer explosion. Um, we pull out of quarters, get on the West side highway, I remember looking down, you could see the smoke, 
you know, pouring up from downtown. And it was a straight run for us down the West side highway. Um, I got the pedal to the metal. And uh, I remember, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Spanky McAllister was the officer that day. And I remember saying, that looks like an awful lot of smoke for a transformer fire. Uh, he said, yeah, you know, but again, that was, that was the only information we had to go on. So I get there uh, and there's a, uh, at the street level, there's a ramp that goes down to a parking garage. So I pull a rig up next to the ramp and I park there. That's where we're going to stay. Uh, look over and there's heavy smoke pouring out of the gar parking garage doors on the street level. And some of the doors look like they're you know, bent, you know, like twisted and bent. So they take off to go down. Now I'm the chauffeur. I got to get out of the rig and go to the rear compartment. Because uh, you know, on the way there, they're, you know, they, they're able to get dressed in the back of the rig masks and everything. So they take off. They're ready. I go to the back of the rig. I'm, I'm putting, I, I have everything on except my turnout coat and my mask. So I put the turnout coat on, I'm throwing the mask on. And as I do, uh, a fellow comes up to me and, he's, and he, I don't remember, it was a Harlem truck. I, you know, he might've said I'm in 26 truck or 23 truck, whatever. Can I help you? You know, he was off duty, but so I was like, well, hang out for a minute, you know. Maybe you can, you know, help me, uh, you know, bring in the search line. You can hold one into the search line when I go in, whatever. So um, I get dressed and so this is my first attempt. I try to call uh, Spanky on the radio, show for the rescue, and I don't get an answer. Show for the rescue, I don't get an answer. Show for the rescue. Because at that point, um, a guy had come up the ramp. In like in the, in the gray shirt and pants, like the, one of the uh, you know operating engineers or you know one of the guys that worked in the building, mm -hmm. and he was full of soot and all shaken. And he said to me, "There's people hurt down there." So now I'm figuring out they went that way, but I'm going to go down where this guy's telling me there's people hurt. I want to let the officer know because you try to keep you know unit cohesiveness. Um, but and that goes to a later story when we found out that the radios did not work. In, with all the twisted metal and in, in, in these, you know, the high rise with the, you know, down below grade, which has, which caused the FDNY to do a whole study on radios and things, which came later on. But so at that point, we didn't know. We figured the radios, we knew they didn't work in the subway because we used to set up this uh, radio relay back then. Like if it was a subway job where the, uh, the, the truck company would send like the, the uh, OV would go down to the, where the stairs go down. You'd have one guy that would go down at the at, at stand on the end of the platform, uh, you know, one position like that would be, say, the OV. Then the roof man would stay at the bottom of the stairs and then the chauffeur would be at the top of the stairs. And you'd have to do a re radio relay to get messages back and forth because the radios you know, didn't work from the, the, the subway level to the street level, with concrete and below grade. You know, since then, a lot of things have changed. But in 92 or 93, when the bombing occurred, we still had th those other uh, analog radios or whatever they were. So they're off. They don't know where I'm going. I don't know where they are. I, I take off into the building and uh, this fellow's coming with me. I bring a search line and we're heading down and I can see some blood, you know, not, not a lot of blood, but little trickles of blood. And I kind of follow it to, uh, it looks like, like a, it's a room, doors open um, and there's controls for, I guess, different heating systems and plant, you know, the plant systems. And, uh, I look in it, you know, I search in there. It's, it's, there's stuff that's blown over and everything, but I can, I can get in there and search and I don't see anybody. And I come back out, we go a little further and now I'm starting to see, you know, doors blown over, um, some, some cinder block blown out, uh, smoke. And it was starting to get, I had a mask. This other fellow didn't have a mask. So it got to the point where it was getting a little too dicey for a guy without a mask. So I said to him, um, you know, if you want to stay here, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go in as far as I can with the search line. But, you know, if you got to leave, you leave. So I, I, I went into another room uh, as far as I could. And um, at that point, I came back out and I said, listen, brother. You know, you can hang out. It's up to you. But I, I got to go in. You know, I got to go further. And you got no mask on. So at that point, we parted our ways. Uh, I went to the next room. I, I went down a hallway and and. Um, I hit a doorway and as I do, I, it's 
there's a lot of smoke, but I can I can make out some, you know, that there's lockers, metal lockers that are blown over. So I'm figuring it's it's like a room for the working guys that, you know, where they can change and stuff. Uh, and then I, I'm crawling over lockers and then there's like some like lunch tables. So I figured this was like, you know, they room, a room for them. So I'm hitting the tables and there's there's some heat, not a tremendous amount of heat, but there's the, the smoke is unbelievable. It's like marshmallowy smoke now that's starting. It's coming and it's just, you know, um, but I can see as I, I crawl a little further. And all of a sudden I crawl and I got to stop because there's no floor left. It's just a, a jagged edge. And, you know, at this point I'm, I'm looking as it's, so you got to remember you're, you're in, a, you got all this smoke. I got this jagged edge and I'm kind of looking out and I see like a, like maybe, I don't know, 60, 70, you know, 80 feet away, uh, like a line of fire, just like it's almost a straight line of fire. And then I look down and there's another straight line of fire. And then I look down and there's another straight line of fire. And I'm, I'm, and my mind's not really computing at this point. Like, you know, what's going on here? So I'm, I'm you know, like still sitting there and I'm all right. So now I'm realizing, all right, this obviously is some type of explosion because this, I got, I got a jagged and I'm looking down into a hole now, you know, and what it was is I was on one edge of the crater that was left when the bomb exploded. This was the, in the parking garage. It was six levels of parking. So what it turned out to be was all those floors had been blown and I'm at the edge of it, so I can't go any further. And what I'm looking across at, which I realized later when I went back was those were all the cars on each parking level. So I don't know if you've ever, ever seen a car fire, but one car, you can imagine, you know how much smoke that generates between the gasoline mm -hmm rubber tires burning and the upholstery. You know, now imagine, I, I don't, I don't know how many cars, I think it held over, you know, maybe a thousand cars in the parking garage, maybe more. I'm sure you could Google it, but so now you got, you know, I got, I'm looking across it, you know, what else? A hundred cars in a row burning, giving off smoke. And, and so that was the red glow and it was layered because each layer of car was, you could see the orange glow and then, you know, with the byproducts, all the smoke was there. So that was kind of surreal. And then um, from there, I, I try to go a little further. I go down a hallway, and now that's completely blocked because the whole wall and everything is blown over, and it's taken up the, the hallway in, that, in the B2 level. So I back up. I, I find another way. I go around, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm in what looks to be like an elevator lobby, which it did turn out to be an elevator lobby, and it, it's – it's all, you know, blown and everything's blown and everything. And I, I crawl up to it and I look and there's the elevator, you know, like down and in, in, in amongst the rubble. And there's a woman in there. And I'm, I can't really get that. I can almost like I'm I just barely like feel I'm trying to, to see if I can get a pulse or anything. I, I couldn't couldn't get a pulse. <clears throat> I'm on the radio. I'm trying to reach anybody. I'm like show for the rescue. So, you know, nothing. Show for the rescue. And I was like, show for the, any unit and nothing. <clears throat> Luckily, about two minutes later, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move stuff, which is next to impossible. You know, I'm, this is, you know, your little pieces of brick and everything. <clears throat> Luckily, I hear voices. So I'm like, hello, I'm, 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 I'm yelling. And they're like, yeah, yeah, this is rescue shelter. I, I think there's like yeah, five trucks. So five truck, I think, was like first to want a second alarm. And I guess they were given the job to search and look for victims. So there was that group had come down to the B2 level. So I called them to where I was. And I said, we have a, you know, a body. Here. I don't know if she's alive or, or whatever, but, you know, you're going to need some other tools. And you're going to need you know, help here. So I, I think the, the officer was a guy, Lieutenant Woods, who uh, luckily I had I, he, he was a covering lieutenant that I had drove. He had, he had worked the tour and rescue one. I had drove him like maybe two months earlier. So we kind of knew each other from that day. So, um, I, you know, I told him, you know, this is what you got. And, um, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't have the right, you know, I have what I need here to get, get this done. We need manpower and you might need purse tool or some other thing. So he, basically what I was telling him was you got it. And then at the same point, I think uh, rescue, 
might have been rescue. I think Terry Hatton was working, but he might have been working in rescue four that day. Because I remember him coming down, and then you know we knew each other, and I told him, you know, this is there's a woman in there, five trucks here. Um, again, long story short, they I, I ended up leaving. I was I needed to find my company. I you know I couldn't do anything more here. I had two companies now that could work to extricate her. So um, fast forward, that was a woman in there, and I think. I forget her name. I think she was pregnant. I think she Monica was Monica Rodriguez Smith. Okay. I think she was the only woman to be that was that got killed. I think the other five were, were males. Yeah. So I, I leave that and I get I work my way back to the street level. And now I'm on a radio again. And that by now, I mean now I don't know how many alarms you got the command post is set up out in the street. A lot different from when we first got there on the first alarm. You know, and, and, and I've done what I've done. That is, I don't know, they may be up to a third, fourth alarm, fifth alarm by now. Because I think it went to like 16 alarms. So there's rigs in the street and um, a lot of radio traffic, you know, and you don't want to step on people. So you wait, you know. Uh, but again, I could not reach my company. Unbeknownst to me, when they went in, Kevin Shea, I don't know if you're familiar with that story. I am. But Kevin had fallen down into the hole. So now my company is, they don't have me. Kevin's down in the hole and they're, they're trying to find Kevin to get him out. So, and, and where they are, their radio is not picking me up. But by then, at, at that point, I found out later, they had already extricated Kevin and he was on his way to the hospital with the other guys from Rescue One, except for one member. Um, and I, I honestly, if you ask me, I. I I think it might have been Harvey Harrell, but I can't swear to it. Or Timmy Kelly, one or the two. Because finally, when I couldn't reach the company, I said uh, to the command post, I said, rescue show for the command, urgent. You go ahead with your urgent. I said, this is rescue show for, I've been unable to contact my company for the, you know, uh, for the duration. Do you have any idea where they're located? All right, stand by. So then uh, he says, all right, rescue one, uh, show for, come to the command post. So I go to the command post and that's when they explained to me that Kevin had fallen down the hole. They were all at the hospital. And then, uh, like I said, either Harvey or Timmy had, I met up with them at the command post. And at that point we were, you know, we were, we were at, we didn't have a company. We were out of service. It was later on in the day. And, um, at that point, the, uh, you know, we hung out for a while and then the night tour was coming in. So the night tour came in and they relieved us and we went back to quarters so for me, that's why I say it was, it was a very frustrating, no impact day because, um, I, you know, nothing I did seemed to have changed the outcome of the fire, saved anybody's life. Um, it was just, you know, the magnitude of the whole thing was, uh, was overwhelming. And, uh, you know, like I said, the, the fact that I felt like I, I really didn't accomplish anything and frustrated with the radios that we had. Um, just made it uh, the only thing that it did do it put me on a campaign to you know I mean I was just a pawn you know a firefighter but I made sure that the chiefs and my officers knew that there was an issue with the radios and apparently other companies had issues too so that prompted them to start looking into uh, what the problem was and how it could be rectified so maybe that was the only good thing that came out of it.